But yeah, great to, to see everybody. And I'm going to just go straight in now and uh, read our two readings. The first of these is from Matthew's Gospel, chapter 3. If you have a Bible, you may wish to follow it. But the words will appear on the screen. I'm reading from the nearly infallible version. I'm in the New International Version. So this is Matthew 3, starting at verse 13. Then Jesus came from Galilee to the Jordan to be baptised by John. But John tried to deter him, saying, I need to be baptised by you. And do you come to me? Jesus replied, Let it be so for now. It is proper for us to do this, to fulfil all righteousness. Then John consented. As soon as Jesus was baptised, he went up out of the water. At that moment, heaven was opened, and he saw the Spirit of God descending like a dove and alighting on him. And a voice from heaven said, This is my Son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. Our second reading is from the second letter to the Corinthians, chapter 5. 2 Corinthians 5. And I'm going to read verses 16 to 21. From now on we regard no one from a worldly point of view. Though we once regarded Christ in this way, we do so no longer. Therefore, if anyone is in Christ, the new creation has come, the old has gone, the new is here. All this is from God, who reconciled us to himself through Christ and gave us the ministry of reconciliation. That God was reconciling the world to himself, to Christ, in Christ, not counting people's sins against them. And he has committed to us the the message of reconciliation. We are therefore Christ's ambassadors, as though God were making his appeal through us. We implore you on Christ's behalf, be reconciled to God. God made him who had no sin to be sin for us, so that in him we might become the righteousness of God. Now, in the news this week, uh, you may have not noticed this particular item of news, only a little one, but I spotted it. Uh, There was a man in Turkey whose name was Bayan Mutlu. Uh, And uh, here is his story, which is true. So, Bayan Mutlu, Turkish chap, went out for a pint with a few of his mates. Uh, It turned out to be a few pints, uh, perhaps rather more than he anticipated. So as he was on his way home, walking home uh, in western Turkey where he lived, he thought, oh, I can't be bothered to walk any further. I'll just kip for the night in these woods here. So he staggered into the woods, laid himself down and slept, slept for the rest of the night. In the morning, <clears throat> um, Ben, by the way, was a mature man of 50 years. <laughs> you wouldn't think it so far in the story, would you? But there you go. In the morning, his wife woke up, realised that he wasn't there. And she thought, oh, no, he's gone missing. What can have become? I hope he hasn't befallen a terrible accident. So she alerted the authorities, who sent out a search party to look for him. Anyway, back to Bayon. He's lying there in the woods, and he wakes up, and it's a lovely morning, and he thinks, oh, I feel better for that now. And off he goes, and as he's walking out of the woods, he sees a large group of people who are evidently searching for something. So he said, uh, what are you guys doing out here? And they said, we're looking for, for a missing person. And he says, oh. Do you mind if I join you? And they said, yeah, the more the merrier. (laughs) So so off they went together to look for the missing person. And then after a while, I don't know how long this would be. I mean, it could have been five minutes. It could have been three hours. So, you know, not having found anybody, they stopped. And one of the fellows shouted, Ben Mutlu, where are you? And he went, I'm here. (laughs) You sort of imagine, can't you? (laughs) <laughs> and they're, they're all sort of turned That'll be the look on their faces, you know. So effectively, this Turkish gentleman had spent most of the morning looking for himself. And you can see where I'm going with this, I'm sure. Because there are many of us in this life, and we spend most of our time wondering who we are, or wondering where we are, 
looking for ourselves, trying to find ourselves. I mean, it's a thing, isn't it? There are people making loads of money out of us looking for ourselves, writing guidebooks, self-help books, self-help books, books about understanding yourself, find, find yourself. There's a place that I really want to go to, and I don't know if I'll ever get there in my lifetime. I'd love to go there, and that is Delphi. Anybody been to Delphi? Oh, Val, you would have. That's okay. I'll talk to you about it. See, did you did, you went up to the temple? At... Yeah, that time. Cool. I'd love to go there. I was thinking of maybe going. I had a sabbatical in the summer. I was thinking of maybe going then, and then of course, you know, COVID happened. Didn't go anywhere really out of this country anyway. I'd love to go there. If you've never heard of Delphi, it's on one of the Greek islands, and it's a bit off the tourist destination path, I believe. So you have to kind of mean it if you want to go there. But it was an ancient route, route of pilgrimage. And this is like pre-Christian. And people used to journey there to this island. And they used to go up this pilgrim path. I suppose a bit like the one on St. Michael's Mount. But I'm guessing a lot more arduous and long-winded. And eventually they would reach the Temple of Apollo at the top. And in the Temple of Apollo there was what they called the Oracle of Delphi. Which was a succession of women, because uh, the, the oracle at Delphi lasted for about a thousand years. It was a long-winded thing. And she would sit there in a cave, uh, and there was, a big, there was a fissure in the ground. You can look this up. It's fascinating to read about it. It really is. A fissure in the ground. And she would sit on a stool pretty much over the, the open fissure in the ground, through which all this gas was rising from who knows where, down below. So she was pretty high all the time on these gases, and she would come out with all this crazy ecstatic sort of rubbish but people would go there believing that she was speaking the words of Apollo the god who doesn't exist obviously and they would uh, they would act upon her advice anyway this is kind of circumstantial the bit that interests me is that apparently if you do make that journey to the oracle at Delphi which is no longer there but the temple is on the temple wall is written the words Know thyself. And I remember reading this fascinating story (laughs) uh, and then just being really struck by that. That all those thousands of years ago, it was considered to be important. It had occurred to people in Greece that one of the key things in life is knowing and understanding who you are. So as much as it's about reaching out to the gods, or in our case, God, Jesus, the real God, It's also about understanding your place in the world, your purpose, the reason that you're here. And that can be really difficult. And like that Turkish chap, we can spend a lot of time, waste a lot of time wandering around, lost, wondering who we are. Now, the gospel reading that I've chosen today from Mark is right at the beginning of Jesus' ministry. And it's Jesus' baptism. And the reason I've chosen that in the context of what we're talking about already is that that was the moment when Jesus came into who he was. And it, it's a kind of an interesting scenario because when Jesus is in the River Jordan being baptised and he comes up out the water, you get all three persons of the Trinity showing up. Jesus obviously is there. But God is there as well because God speaks. He says, this is my beloved son. In an audible voice that is heard by at least Jesus and John the Baptist and whoever else happened to be there. This is my beloved son. In him I am well pleased. So Jesus is there. God the Father has shown up. And the Spirit, as we heard in the reading, descends like a dove on Jesus. And that's seen by Jesus and it's also seen by John the Baptist. I know it doesn't say so in Mark's Gospel, but if you compare it to John's Gospel, the beginning of John's Gospel, where the baptism isn't mentioned, but John says, this guy is the Lamb of God. He's the Saviour. He's the Messiah. I know it. I've seen it with my own eyes because I saw the Spirit descend on him like a dove. Was it a real dove? Dunno. Did it appear to be in the shape of a bird? Don't know. Or was it just the fact that it appeared to come down, whatever it was, that made John describe it as like a dove descending gently, peacefully? I mean, at the beginning of Acts, 
It was like tongues of fire descending on them. That was the best description they could provide. Here, John says, like a dove. If you could see the Holy Spirit of God descending on you or on somebody else in this room, I wonder how you'd describe it. You'd probably use an example from your own life that you felt would describe it best. But I'm guessing the experience of actually witnessing, seeing the Holy Spirit descend on someone is something pretty out there, something pretty unusual that our normal human experience finds it hard to define. But you cannot ignore it. Now, if you've ever been filled with the Holy Spirit, then you will know what that feels like. I remember years ago, and uh, I, I, I personally never experienced that filling of the Holy Spirit, you know, when it all drops on you. The, the thing that, that, not so much perhaps now, well no, it still, still does, makes people fall over, you know. And we should never be afraid of it, especially not in a church that's carpeted. My last church had a hard wooden floor, I was, I was very wary of people going over. In fact, I do remember, after, there was one morning service <clears throat> where we did as it were, an appeal. Come forward to receive the Holy Spirit, we said. And people started coming forward. Uh, you know, When you do a thing like that, there's always that awkward moment when you've just done it, where you think, is actually anybody going to move? Yeah? Because then, if they don't, I've got to have a kind of a, you know, a sort of a, a way of getting out of this. <laughs> but no, people started to come forward. They started to come forward and they formed a line. And very quickly I realised that me and the few other people who were up there were not enough to lay hands on all of these people and ask God to fill them with the Holy Spirit. You see, as often happens as we practice our Christian faith, as we step out in faith, the Lord sort of gives us much more of an abundance than we were expecting. We sort of say, well, I suppose we could probably forecast one or two people and then like 20 appear, you know, and you're just not up for it. So after that service, I said to my lovely wife Adele, I said, we've got to, we've got to do a little, we've got to sort this out, because if this is going to happen again, because a few of them were getting a bit wobbly, and I thought they were going to go over, and if they'd gone over on this hard floor, that wouldn't have been good. You could have, you know, you were invited to come to church this morning, and then to follow on to A&E, the after party. you know, we don't want that. So I said, uh, at the end of that service, I said, could some of the fellas please remain? Some of the gentlemen of the church, particularly the bigger, strong ones, because uh, we just need to do a bit of catching training. And so we did. And we sort of, done, you know, if you see somebody going down, how to catch them and lower them gently to the floor, not to judge them and, and not to attempt to revive them in most cases because they're actually okay. Yeah? And uh, so, yeah, why are we telling it? Oh, yeah, because the fe- that feeling of... Getting a bit wobbly, wanting to fall over. Sometimes, you know, just having to sit down so that you don't fall over. And I'd never experienced this earlier on in my life. And I thought, who can I ask about this falling over lark, which seemed so odd? So I went to one of the more senior men in my church. And I said, can you explain to me? What did it? I said, have you ever fallen over in the power of the Spirit? He said, yes, frequently. And I looked at him and he, he looked well enough. <laughs> so I said, well, why does it happen? And he said, I'll tell you why. This is a man in his 70s. I said, he said, I'll tell you why. He says, imagine you're there praising the Lord. You're lost in wonder, love and praise. Your eyes are closed, your arms are up. You stood there. And the Lord decides to put his spirit into you. And it descends upon you and it fills you. As we've just seen in Mark's Gospel. He says, imagine that. He says, imagine being filled so full of love and that sense of being loved. He says, you just can't take it. He says, it can be too much for you. He says, you, you feel the surge of it through your body. You know, the, the, the goosebumps on the back of the neck, all that. And he says, and sometimes you just fall over. And he says, it's all right. And then you rest in the Lord for a while. And then you get up and everything's great. And I thought, oh, I want some of that, please. Jesus. I never have fallen over in the Lord, but I have known what it's like to be filled with the Spirit. Have you? I hope you have. And if you haven't, I hope you will. Because He wants to do it. Don't you all fall over hurt yourselves, but we do want to be filled with the Holy Spirit, warmed from within by the Holy Spirit. And it was described by John as being like a dove. The dove is the sign of peace, 
how wonderful for some of us sitting here if we could know the Holy Spirit filling us full of peace. Because that's actually really what we could do with right now, for whatever reason. So the Holy Spirit arrives. And the Holy Spirit was not freely given, remember, at this point in history. It's only after Pentecost that it was available to all of us. But it arrived and God's voice spoke. And those words that God speaks, this is my son whom I love, with him I am well pleased. They hark back to Isaiah 42 as usual. God, when he speaks, speaks the word that he's already spoken once before. When God speaks to us now, he often speaks with, from scripture, doesn't he? And that's how we know it's him. And at the very beginning of Isaiah 42, God says, Here is my servant whom I uphold, my chosen one, in whom I delight. I will put my spirit on him, and he will bring justice to the nation. And then it goes on, and I'm sure you're familiar with the suffering servant passages in Isaiah. Those very specific prophecies that Isaiah makes about Jesus, the Messiah. But we see God's word there. It would have come as no surprise then to people who heard what God said on that day to go, Oh gosh, well, he said that before, that's definitely him. So at that point, Jesus begins his earthly ministry. His journey begins. People often think, did Jesus know before that point? Did Jesus know when he was a boy that that cross was waiting for him at the end of his life, at the end of 33 years? Don't really know. We certainly know that by the age of 12, Jesus knew who his father was. It wasn't a carpenter from Nazareth. It was God. Jesus knew that. Because when he got left behind in the temple, he said, well, you would expect to find me in my father's house, wouldn't you? So he knew that. But did he know about the cross? Some theologians conjecture that it was at the point of his baptism, when he was filled with the Holy Spirit, when God spoke over him, that his ministry was commissioned, his ministry began, and from that point on he knew where his road was leading. So you see, even if he didn't fully know before, when Jesus came out of the River Jordan, he knew himself. He wasn't running around wondering what he was on the planet to do, as many of us do. He knew, because God had told him. And if you're in doubt, we have that reading from 2 Corinthians, which says what Jesus came here to do. He came to be the substitute for our sin, though he had never done anything wrong, ever. He placed himself in our place, that God chose not to deal with us as we deserve. Instead he sent Jesus to take the penalty, to pay the penalty for our sin, to be crucified in our place, so that we can be reconciled with God. Even now, sometimes we think, don't we? We think, where is God? He seems far away. Where could he be? Well, the answer is he's close by at all times. It's just sometimes a bit like our Turkish friend who got lost in the forest and then joined his own search party. Sometimes we can't see clearly where we're going. But God can. All of the time. And so we know... <clears throat> And it's our responsibility to tell as many people as possible that there is really only one way to discover yourself and to know who you are. You've got to ask God and he will tell you. He will reveal it to you, possibly over quite a long period. Remember that in the Bible, God often called people to do specific things, Abraham, Moses, etc., later in their life. They might have been living all of their lives faithfully, trying to trust in God and do what God wanted up until that point, but thinking, well, I'm not sure what I'm here to do. And then God would speak to them and say, now, now is the time. I want you to do this. And then they responded and amazing things happened. God could do this at any point. But make no mistake, he wants to do things in your life. He wants to use you for his Glory. Sometimes people say to me, why do, why do you Christians go to church? You know, why do you do so much singing? And I don't know about you, but singing in praise to God is one of the things I have missed massively during the pandemic. 2020, when we couldn't sing, that was just awful. 
And I remember the experience of going back into church for the first time when we could actually sing and how emotional that was. To be able to do that thing again together with one another, it was fantastic. One of the main reasons that we are here, the reason why we exist, is to make God happy, to bring him glory, to make him feel good. And if God feels good about us, then we can feel good about ourselves. If we truly know ourselves, that's because we've known God first.